Hi, I am incredibly honored and so excited to be introducing Jennifer Tipton, the lighting designer, as our capstone final interview for this round five of Global Conversations. Um, Jennifer, welcome, welcome. We are so excited to be talking to you. Thank you, Liza. I'm delighted to be here. And you're out in the middle of nowhere. You're in the middle of Maine. Do you sort of retreat to get inspiration or does it do? Oh, I definitely ran away from the pandemic. I have been here since March 2020 and will be moving back to New York in um, the end of August. And you have uh, a play opening at Hunter College in September. Um, which you said is a theater in the round, although it's actually square and it's it's quite small and intimate, but that's that's coming up. Yes, yes, that's very soon. And I haven't yet done the plot and I haven't done a plot for it for anything in a year. So um, this is all gonna be quite new and exciting. So how much prep time are you actually gonna have for this for this play in September? I discovered not very much because um, the uh, set designer has been working on the plans. And so they have to get me the plans and then I have to do the plot, at which point I will send it to my associate to draft, et cetera, et cetera. And then we uh, are loading it in. That means hanging the lights on something like um, August 6th. So that's all coming up very soon, and I haven't started, so I am <laughs> nervous. <laughs> how, how much can you do up in Maine? Um, I mean, you oh, can I have a drafting table, and I can I can do it all. I I'm prepared. I have spent you know many times doing a plot here in Maine because this is my vacation home. And then you've got intimate apparel coming up, um, which is is am I correct? That's opera. Yes, that's a small opera being done at the Mitzi Newhouse Lincoln Center Theater. You've done sort of everything. I mean, you've done Twyla Tharp, ABT, you've done dance, you've done opera, you've done intimate plays. How does the space inform it? How does, does the, the type of performing art change your approach at all? Of course it does, but I mean, no more than each production changes it to a degree. I try to be specific to what I am lighting. Um, if, if the theater is big, then you have to have brighter lights, more powerful lights. So it really does change the equipment, but it may not change the idea behind the light. Does the fabric of the seats or the architecture of the venue change how the light bounces and how you certainly, need to Certainly the architecture does. I, I mean, one is rarely lighting the seats, though you may be. I mean, in Mockingbird, there <clears throat> is a time when the, the men in the play do use the aisles, but then I'm lighting aisles and not seats. Usually, of course, the um, seats are covered by audience. We hope they all are. <laughs> Every single one. <laughs> So the color of the seats isn't really uh, pertinent because you have different colors every night with different audience members. Now, it just occurred to me from, from fashion shoots and stuff like that, that, you know, they hold, they hold scrims and stuff like that and it reflects back light. And it was occurring to me, you know, some fabric absorbs light, some gives it off. So I was just curious. That's certainly true of costumes and Which hair and the color of people's hair, actors' hair. So, um, so you might have a plan, but you get in there and you see the costumes and you see the, the actor's hair and you have to adjust a little bit. Right. I, I lit a, a dance for the Joffrey Ballet long, long time ago, and I've forgotten what it was. But uh, in the second cast that came up, there was a redhead <laughs> and the light. I did have to uh, change the light a little bit. How, how does Jennifer Tipton come to be? Where did you start? Did you see yourself ending up here? Take us, take us a little bit from the beginning and then as, as things progress for you. Well, I certainly didn't see myself ending up here. <laughs> but uh, I, I started, uh, I, I went to Cornell University 
And I wanted to be the first person on the moon. So I went to Cornell majoring in physics. But, I, but my mother at the time said that my letter sounded like Cornell was a dance school. So <laughs> I ended up wanting to be a dancer. And now my parents were both college professors. My father was a zoologist and my mother was a physicist. So there was no question I would finish college. But when I did, I came to New York to be, be a dancer. And I um, did, you know, became a, a, someone who had to go and watch performances to critique the dancers, mm -hmm. like a personal mistress. And I looked at the bigger picture and it was light and I fell in love with it and I've been in love with it ever since. So that's that pretty much the story. I mean, how I did all the things I did. Most lighting designers are pigeonholed, it's, it's true. But I have, um, I have been very excited in my life to be doing lots of different things. And I enjoy it. And one thing teaches me about other things. So um, I, I, I learn about theater. First, I began at lighting dance. Okay. But I learned about theater through the lighting of dance. And then I learned about lighting opera through the lighting of theater and dance. And so each thing has fed the next. And skating. <laughs> and skating, yes. That was, that was really a challenge because uh, on, on, um, at uh, Albert Hall, it wasn't such a challenge because everybody somehow had a view of the whole space. But it was also done at the Metropolitan Opera House. And there, it was very difficult to make the audience or allow the audience to see the huge space that the skaters were, were um, covering. And so that was a big challenge. Could you talk a little bit about keeping up with technological advances, uh, figuring out your own advances, how computers uh, have changed it or not changed the lighting? Yes, well, technology, first of all, I am not a technician. And so technology and my knowledge of technology is not very good. These days I depend a great deal on my associates. But um, certainly it was very exciting to, I mean, I came from the days when you had all this black cable that you had to lug around and plug in here and plug in there. And you had to uh, attach dimmer boards to electricity and it was all very um, labor intensive. But uh, uh, it, it was so exciting when, there, when computer control became part of the mix to be able to make a cue last for a minute, for 10 minutes had to have overlapping things happen. That was all quite wonderful. The one thing I, I did do as a, when I called cues early in, in my life, um, I counted backwards. My mentor, Tom Skelton taught me to do that. I counted backwards so that if there was a 10 count cue, I started at 10 and ended at zero. If you start at one, then you may not remember how far you're going. That's what, we have. <laughs> what your count is going to be. Yeah. Got so it. I, I have counted backwards in many, many, many languages, actually, as oh, I've toured so cool. dance companies over the world, because you could phrase it. You could make it so that the light would, would speed up and then slow down because you were counting faster or slower and looking at the stage as you counted. So when the computer came along, I said, oh, I'm not gonna like the fact that I can't control the dynamics of the light changing anymore. But of course, as it turned out, it's a wonderful thing that when someone pushes a button, the cue happens in exactly the same way 
every time. That's wonderful. But anyways, touring the world with mainly the Paul Taylor Company, it was, uh, you know, it was certainly in the, the one place that really kind of stymied me was um, uh, uh, China. I had it to, to write it down phonetically and I could never remember it night to night. So I had to sort of do a, a refresher course just before the performance began every night when we did it in Hong Kong primarily. That is wonderful. I, I hadn't thought about, so you could go 10, 9, 8, but, but, or you could go 10, 9, 8, and, 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 and play. And, and, and in those days, of course, the electrician was doing the dimmers up and down. So the electrician too could go faster and slower. Of course, we program that these days on an on a electronic computer. Do you have a group of people that you work with consistently? No, no. Lighting designers in theater work with uh, different people on it, on each production, actually. So, and I have an assistant, but I'm teaching. I teach it at Yale, and therefore I use a different assistant. Well, two two assist two lighting designers graduate from Yale each year. And I have made it my plan to use those two in the year following their graduation. So that too is always changing. Sometimes I've said, oh, wouldn't it be great to have one assistant that works with me over a period of time, but I've chosen another route and, and I'm happy. Do they only take two a year? Yes. They, oh boy, I bet, I bet that's a coveted spot. Yes, yes, it's wow. It's good. But it, but it's, but it's good because that that is the work, the practical work that we have that is available. So we don't take more than we can allow a good training. You mentioned, by the way, that you majored in physics and that your mother was um, um, a professional. I don't phys physics. Physics. A physicist. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she must have been a bit of a pioneer as well. Oh, she definitely was. As a matter of fact, she went to the University of Georgia as an undergraduate and she wanted to be a chemist. And she went to the chemistry department and they wanted no part of a woman. So she went to the physics department and they greeted her with open arms. So she became a physicist. Do you use the physics at all in... I mean, even conceptually when you're doing- Not, your not really, not really. I mean, truly, I think the, the, the most mathematics that I use is um, figuring out overloads of dimmers. So that's adding, that's addition. <laughs> that's interesting. I'm doing well, that, no, that's, that's not true because I do use, use angle ideas in figuring out what lights will cover before choosing them. You had talked about college a little bit and then Cornell being, you applying to it as if it were a dance school, which I think is very, very funny. Uh, and, and then were a dancer for a while, got to New York and then fell in love with lighting. So tell us from there. Well, I mean, from there, I pretty much, I guess, joined the um, Paul Taylor company and toured with that company for, um, oh, seven or eight years, let's say. So after the Paul Taylor dance company came into my life, there was a dancer who uh, she and I shared a bedroom in Spoleto, as a matter of fact. Her name was Twyla Tharp. Oh my goodness. Started her own company. <laughs> And I was there and her recent um, uh, American Masters for uh, television recently showed all those old dances that I kept saying to myself, oh, I was there, I was there. I, I, I turned on the lights. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, I, I, I love that program and dancing out in Central Park, et cetera. So you shared 
a bedroom. Well, I didn't light Central Park, needless to say. Right, you're right. But you <laughs> but were the indoor dancing. I certainly, I was there. Can you can you tell us a little bit about those days? I mean, I I just it 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 seems so revolutionary, but it it seemed like she just wouldn't take no for an answer. It, it that's true. That is absolutely what happened, and we just went everywhere and did everything and she did not take no for an answer and and it was it, you know somehow of course doing it it wasn't earth shattering we just did it this is what you do this is what you have to do um and as far as being a woman in dance that's or in in theater in lighting that's always one one good thing about that is of the three original lighting designers in America, two of them were women. When was lighting design um, in the United States a thing? I mean, when, when was it a profession or an art? How long has it been around? I, I think, well, I mean, it's been around as long as theater has been around, but as, as its own profession, as its own art, I think that started around the time of, of the uh, depression, coming out of the depression. And the theater that was done then, I think. Jean Rosenthal was her name. And uh, the other woman was Peggy Clark. And the third person was Abe Fader. Those three, I think really, I know that Jean Rosenthal had electricians write down what they did so they could do it again the next time. Huh. That started then with her. How did working with collaborating with Twyla change you at all? Or did it just reinforce, I am going to do this? I guess it just reinforced because there was no, no question. And I, I really never felt uh, any kind of prejudice. I will admit, I mean, not that I, I mean, there were certainly people, there were certainly crews that challenged me on purpose. And I'm sure it was because that I was a female. But um, I learned how to deal with that. That was all part of the learning of it, I, I felt. And so I never suffered. I mean, the only time it was ever expressed to me is when I went up for a job as a stage manager for a German company that was touring the US. And I was told then that they just wouldn't accept a female stage manager. Well, it sounds like your mother probably, um, you know, probably was a, a great inspiration too. What I, what I love is that both you and Twyla are still working, you're still creating, you know, and it's, it's, um, it's inspiring because it's like, it's not like you have to get it right in your twenties or it's not going to happen. Right. Right. ABT just did a really uh, wonderful evening. That was three pieces of Twyla of Twyla's um, that, and, and Deuce Coop was the first one that they showed. And um, uh, in the upper room was sort of the, last of the three and I you know I had done all three and so it was really exciting to see my work in that evening as well and then um, I uh, having hooked up with Tom Skelton he got me involved with the Joffrey company and so I I toured with them I worked with them as production supervisor for three years. And this, the, this was the greatest education that I could get. Having first of all worked with Paul Taylor, who as a small modern dance touring company uh, used equipment that was already at the theater. We had to use what was available. The uh, Joffrey company toured with its own equipment. So that was learning a whole new aspect. And then after that, I sort of just went out on my own. And I, when I had stopped 
touring, what it meant is that rather than going to Tokyo and um, uh, say Amsterdam or South America or whatever, all those exciting places, I was going to Chicago and St. Louis, <laughs> LA, et cetera. But uh, that too was exciting. And so I've always traveled. What happens when the luggage is lost, when a dance company is on tour? Well, there's different luggage. I mean, there's my own luggage, <laughs> which has happened. But um, I can't, there was never a time when, I mean, there was a time when the uh, equipment was late and then you deal with it as you do, you know, it, in that particular instance, you, you deal with it. Um, but never has, well, that's not true. It has been lost because the Joffrey company went to Russia in uh, 1976, I guess. And indeed, and we took our own equipment, but somehow the Russians made it so that we had to, we people had to leave before our equipment left. A con very convenient because then when we got the cases back, we opened them up and they were empty. <laughs> oh, no way. Yes, way. <laughs> they, oh my, they absconded? Yeah. Or one, one might surmise they absconded with all your lovely Western technology? Yes, indeed. Do you, do you usually have a translator with you that, that speaks lighting, as it were? In it, depends, it depends on the, uh, the situation. Uh, yes, I mean, obviously, not much is going to happen if uh, I can't communicate with the people that I'm working with. So the producer will supply someone who, uh, who can um, translate. But for instance, but for instance, I've just decided that I want to go to Paris in June to rework on, on Midsummer Night's Dream, Balanchine's Midsummer Night's Dream that I did there earlier, a couple of years ago. And um, uh, I doubt, I mean, they kind of pretend that I know how to speak French. I don't pretend. <laughs> I have some more, I, you know, I know something, but but the electricians too, they, they kind of know English. What's nice for them is that they can pretend that they don't know what I'm talking about if, <laughs> if necessary. <laughs> I won't say that sounds very French, but it definitely sounds very Parisian. Um, yes, yeah. I, I, love, I love the way when I first discovered that when the electricians were always saying, c'est impossible, c'est impossible, which I would translate as it's impossible, simply means we don't do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to Paris to relight a show. Uh, is that for pleasure or mixed business? It, it, mix, that's mix because they, they could do it without me, but it has been a while. I'm sure it will, be, it will look better if I go. So it's, but, but I also, I have the time. And I thought I would never go to Paris again. And now I'm going to Paris again. Talk about collaboration. It sounds to me like there's no way you could do your job in isolation. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, there's collaboration on so many levels. There is the collaboration with my associate, which is profound. And, and but often may just end up being social meaning that it's someone to spend time, not that I like spending time with and I like having dinner with and, and such, but also who can really advise me at certain times when I'm not sure about which way to go. And then of course, there is the artistic team, the director, the set designer, the costume designer, the sound designer, and they're all, you know, it's, it, they're an audience that needs to be pleased because it's their work as well as my work. And, and my work is the one that brings it all together. So they all have to have 
a, a tacit agreement, if not an actual verbal agreement with what I'm doing. And then there are the people who are working, who are really facilitating it. And uh, given a long life in theater, it's not, it's not very pleasant to be arguing all the time. So you do learn, or I have learned, that the best way is to, to really make it a joint effort and make sure that everybody is pleased in some way. Is there a, a, a lighting designer's block the way there's a writer's block? Do you ever like get to a production and do that consultation with folks and talk to the, the, the playwright or, the, or whoever's written the opera and just it's, it's not coming to you? There are those times, but, I, but um, technique, craft, I, I definitely, I have better craft since I've started teaching. In fact, I started teaching and I would say something in class and I would say to myself, if, if I really believe that, then I should change what I'm doing. And so, which I did. And then, so I felt that my, my own craft grew much, much better while, because I was teaching. And I do feel, and I know that there are productions that I have done that the director was not very helpful in, in bringing any thinking about it. And uh, there are many directors who feel, oh, I, don't, I know nothing about light. But of course, we all know about light. It's something that we live with all the time. But um, they'll say that. And then, so I have to depend on myself. And that the craft helps that. I can fall back on the craft. Yeah, fall back on, on do, I, You know, I say, I can do this. I've done this for years. I'd much rather have be pushed around a bit by ideas that come from the director or from the set designer or even costume designer or sound designer. You know, I'm, I'm happy to have those ideas push me around a bit. Are there any, you can share with us which production it was or not, but super, super happy memories of a particular production that just felt right beginning, middle, end. It kind of flowed. It was a joyful collaboration. Um, I would imagine that's, that's a huge fizz, a, a huge. It is, it is. And there have been a few over my lifetime, but the one that I will always remember was early on. It was Jerome Robbins at um, uh, Spoleto in Italy. He did something called Celebration, the Art of the Pas de Deux. And he chose five couples, supposedly each from a different country. And they were basically from a different country, but many of them were New York City Ballet. And each of the five couples did two pas de deux. So that was an evening of 10 pas de deux. And I love making beautiful dancers beautiful. And that's what a pas de deux is about, really. And so I, I did that at uh, Spoleto in Italy, which is a difficult place to work. And in my memory of it, there's only one thing that I would have changed if I could have. It was perfect. It was perfect, except for that one thing. That evening was perfect. So that hasn't happened again in my life. What do you do when disaster strikes? And by now you've probably seen it all, but um, sort of run us through, you know, perhaps earlier in your career, have there been any truly epic flails, fails, et cetera? I, I, yes, I feel they have. And all I could do was say, this too will pass. And it does. <laughs> and you go on to the next thing. I mean, there are a couple of things that I really, there's one thing in particular that I just couldn't, no matter what I did, I couldn't make it look right. I can remember in Spoleto once, this is when the Paul Taylor company was at Spoleto, that uh, the lights did go out 
And it was like a record that we had a live orchestra, but it was like a record slowing down as they <laughs> gradually came to a halt. <laughs> Did you do you have a go bag like you know duct tape and and different oh yes uh, oh yes definitely and in the early days touring with the taylor company it included um black uh fabric because the many of the places where we um performed the curtains the masking was beige because, oh, black is so depressing. So the, the, the schools, they were often high schools. And so they chose beige for their curtains. And also they hung them like an inch off the floor so that it was easier to mop. <laughs> and then the light would just... Exactly, so I would go along and pin black fabric to cover up that inch or so at the bottom so that the light because with that inch all you can see i would imagine exactly. it, you if, know, you put, if you put black behind the beige then it just looked like space you didn't you know, like weren't fabric. aware that there was fabric there i mean do you remember your very first project that you actually got a paycheck for well, I don't remember if I got a paycheck for it. I assume I did, but I got a review. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so it's real. Tell us about what was it? So Don Redlick was the dancer and I went to uh, Richmond, Virginia with him and performed in the museum there. And as I say, got a review. So that was extremely exciting. <laughs> Do you still have it somewhere? <laughs> somewhere, yes, somewhere. <laughs> That's awesome. I think, I think, you know, I, I moved in 2016, maybe. And I couldn't, I, I did, I, I moved from a loft to an apartment and I just didn't have space for everything. So I gave it to the um, Library for Performing Arts, the Lincoln Center. And you know, it's a big rupture in my life. So um, all of this that I thought I, that I think I have, I may not have, <laughs> but maybe somewhere. What inspires you the most? And um, in, in the past, but also looking forward, what's actually really inspiring you? Inspiration is a, a difficult thing to think about, but I certainly know that I love being in the theater. I love watching it gel, shall we say, watching the composition get clearer. Um, that's just thrilling to me, so. And it still gets you year after year. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Have you, have you um, established a routine for yourself? Because it sounds like you operate in so many different places, so many different venues, so many different art forms and sizes of audience. Do you have sort of an approach that you follow? Uh, certainly, work? and I have, and, and I have a, a setup on the, on the lighting desk that, you know, that I try to make the same for myself. So uh, that sometimes gets difficult because of the particular situation. And I always like to be the one talking to the board operator, but obviously if I don't know the language, then it gets sort of diluted. I talk to an electrician who talks to the board operator, et cetera, so. How many people are in the sort of chain that it takes to make the lights go up and down? Well, of course, there I, I, I'm there and my associate is there and the well and and but if i'm like for instance going to paris i won't they won't pay for me to bring somebody so they'll supply somebody and so that somebody is the one who not the one having dinner with me <laughs> <laughs> the one who's talking to the board operator and then of course, something may not be right on stage. And so through this person next to me, he'll talk to somebody backstage and they can go and correct it. 
if the wrong color is in the light or something like that, or I want to change a color. You know, I feel the color isn't right and so needs to be changed. That person can communicate. And then there are a number of people on stage who are ready to bring out a ladder or something like that to refocus the light. Do people ever still change lights um, or gels or whatever by hand? Oh yes, oh yes, definitely. But then that's another situation. Doing, I'm, I'm going to do, going to Paris to do Midsummer Night's Dream. When I did it the first time, I realized I, I, it, it's very complicated and dense scenery. And I needed to light it only with booms. So, um, the, oh, all everything overhead was a, an intelligent light, which is what we call the lights that can move because the computer tells it to move. But the booms, of course, were uh, you have to point them, focus them by hand. And what I realized, since it took me about two weeks to get all the booms focused, <laughs> I realized that they, the crew is not used to focusing by hand anymore. They're used to only having these moving lights that focus with the computer. So that was, that was quite. So there's skills that, that can be lost, right? Exactly. How to actually do this by hand. So I asked you earlier, um, you know, what's, what's coming up for you. And it sounds like quite a bit. And I think that you mentioned you're booking out to January of 2023. Right, right. Which, which is pretty exciting. Yes, there's, there's a production of La Clemenza de Tito, Mozart, that's being done in Salzburg in 2023. Thank you so much. <laughs> you are quite welcome. I have enjoyed it. Thank you.